In this lesson, we are going to discuss finite sets. For each natural number k, let us define n sub k to be the set containing the first k natural numbers. We say that a set is finite if it is either empty or it is equivalent to n sub k. Otherwise, we say that s is infinite. Let us now talk about the cardinality of a set. So first, let us talk about the cardinality of finite sets. We have just seen from the definition that a finite set is either empty or it is equivalent to n sub k. If s is empty, we say that it has cardinal number 0 or cardinality 0 and we write it this way. If the set is equivalent to n sub k, then we say that the cardinality of s is equal to k. Now, in general, we can talk about the cardinality of a set even if it is not finite. If two sets are equivalent, then we say that their cardinalities are equal. And we write it using this notation. Now, suppose that S has cardinality k for some natural number k. That means that there exists a bijection f from nk to S because... If S is cardinality K, it means that S is equivalent to NK, correct? So therefore, this bijection exists. So that means that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence, one, two, three, up to... We call the image of one under the function F to be A sub one, and then we say that this is A sub two, and so on. So that is, we define our f of i to be equal to a sub i for each i from 1 to k. Hence, what are now the elements of s? We can now list all the elements of s as a sub 1, a sub 2, up to a sub k. This is saying that if s is non-empty finite set, then we can always write its elements in this way. We can list all the elements and the list will stop. Here is our first theorem regarding finite sets. First, if A is finite and a set is equivalent to A, then that set must be also finite. So of course, we start with our hypothesis. Always remember that if A is finite, there are always two cases. It is either empty or it is equivalent to N sub K. So therefore, we have to do proof by cases. So for case 1, A is empty. In this case, we want to show that B must also be the empty set. Now, since B is equivalent to A, which we know to be empty, right, this is empty later, there exists a bijection F from A to B. So we will show that B must be empty as well, so that B will be finite. So we will show that B is empty. How do you show that a set is empty? Well, we always proceed by contradiction. So suppose that B is not empty. So therefore, if it is not empty, there exists an element small b in capital B. Now, since F is bijective, it means that it is surjective. Since F is surjective, this element in the codomain will always have a corresponding element in the domain and this small b will be the image of something in a so that means that there exists an a in capital a such that f of small a is equal to b however this contradicts the fact that a is empty So therefore, B must be empty. And since it is empty, B is finite. For our second case, we assume that A is equivalent to N sub K for some natural number K. What do you think will happen here? A is equivalent to N sub K and B is equivalent to A. 
Recall that set equivalence is an equivalence relation, so therefore it must be transitive. So let me just write it first since B is equivalent to A and A is equivalent to N sub K, we have that B must also be equivalent to N sub K. And so E is also finite. So in both cases, we have shown that B is finite. Of course, intuitively, this is true, but we really need to give a formal proof using our definitions. Here is another result which is intuitively true. Every subset of a finite set is finite. Mathematically, this means that if A is a subset of B and B is finite, then A must also be finite. I just wrote it in this way so that we can see the structure of our proof. So for our proof, our hypothesis is that A is a subset of B and B is finite. We want to show that A is finite. Again, we divide our proof into cases because B is finite. So for the first case, B is the empty set. If B is the empty set, what is the only subset of the empty set? Then A must be the empty set as well. And so A is finite. So we have since A is a subset of B and this B here is the empty set, A must be the empty set. And so A is finite. We are done. For other case two, we assume that B is equivalent to N sub K for some natural number K. Since B is equivalent to N sub K, there is a bijection from B to N sub K. What we want to do is to show that A is also finite, meaning to say A is equivalent to N sub something. Now, just for us to imagine what is happening, let us just suppose that B has four elements. So therefore, its elements can be written as B sub 1, B sub 2, B sub 3, and B sub 4. And what will be the bijection? The bijection is B1 goes to 1, B2 goes to 2, B3 goes to 3, and B4 goes to 4. Now suppose that this is our A. It is the set containing B sub 1 and B sub 2. This is my A. And the images of B1 and B2 under the function F is the set containing 1 and 2. This set is the image of a. Now, if we look at this, let me just draw this separately. This is my set A and this is my set F of A. This is now the function F restricted to A. If you still remember the definition of the restriction of a function, correct? This is the restriction of F on the set A and this is from the set a to f of a. And in particular, this f of a over here is our n2. Verify that the restriction of f on the set a from the set a to the image of a under f is bijective. So going back to our proof, let b sub 1 up to b sub k be the set b. And then for exercise, you need to show that the restriction of f on a, and this is from the set a to f of a. This is the image of the set a under the function f. This is bijective. We have shown that a is equivalent to the image of A under F. And so their cardinalities must be equal. However, what can we say about the image set F of A? The image of A under F is just a subset of 
and sub k, correct? Going back to our figure earlier, just like in here, our f of a is n sub 2. Or it's not necessarily n sub 2. Suppose we got b1 and b3. So the image will be 1, 3. It is still a subset of n sub k. So this means that the cardinality of f of a must be less than the cardinality of n sub k. So in particular, we have shown here that the cardinality of a, which is equal to this, is less than the cardinality of n sub k. So this is less than k. Hence, a is finite. So you can also write that a is equivalent to n sub m for some m. This should be equal, less than or equal to k. Or a can also be empty. But in either case, a will definitely be finite. So in this theorem, we have shown that if a is a subset of b and b is finite, then a is finite with the cardinality of a being less than or equal to the cardinality of b. So in the previous theorem, we have shown that the subset of a finite set is finite. Now what happens when we get the union of sets? So the first one is saying here that if we get the union of finite disjoint sets, then it will also be finite and the cardinality of a union b is equal to the cardinality of a plus the cardinality of b. But if we delete this premise that they are disjoint, the union of a and b, the cardinality is equal to the sum of the cardinalities minus the cardinality of their intersection. I know that you have already seen various proofs of this probably when you were in high school so i will no longer prove it and also number one is just straightforward if a and b are finite disjoint sets we can write a to be let's say a sub 1 up to a sub k and then b can be written as let's say b sub 1 up to b sub m and then all the ais are distinct because A has K elements, similarly, BIs are distinct. And moreover, all the A sub I's are different from the B sub J's. AI is not equal to BJ for all I and J. Of course, I is from 1 to K and J is from 1 to M. So thus, your A union B, we just combine them, A1 up to A sub K b1 up to b sub m and this one has m plus k elements so for part two we will just have the elements of the intersection counted twice so therefore we have to subtract them now we want to generalize theorem three not just for two sets the first one is saying that if you get a finite union of finite sets, it will again be finite. This is a generalization of this one. The union of two finite sets are finite. And then this one here, if they are pairwise disjoint, then the cardinality of the union is just equal to the sum of the cardinalities. This is a generalization of part one over here. The proof of this is left as exercise and what method of proof are we going to utilize? We need to use the principle of mathematical induction. Suppose that we want to form the Cartesian product of two finite sets. The cardinality of the Cartesian product is just equal to the product of the cardinality. So this is saying that when we have finite sets, the product of two finite sets is again finite. Let us prove this. Of course, I know that you have seen the proof of this using fundamental principle of counting. However, we want to use the definition of equivalent sets and finite sets. So we have to make use of the bijection. So since A and B are finite, let me just first write here, let A and B be finite sets. So since they are finite, 
we can write the elements of A, let's say, as A sub 1 up to A sub K. And the elements of B to be equal to B sub 1 up to B sub L for some natural numbers K and, K and L. Now let us consider the set A sub small s. This is the set A small s B sub i. I is from 1 to L. So A sub s, all the first coordinates are equal to A sub s and the second coordinates are from B sub 1 up to B sub L. So that is my a sub 1 is equal to, the first coordinate is a sub 1, b1, up to a sub 1, b, l. My a sub 2 is this set. And I have up to a sub k. Just wrote it down here so that you will be able to imagine what's going on. Now, what can we say about these sets? By the way, your a sub s here, consider the sets a sub s, s from... 1 to k. So note that first, all my a sub s are non-empty. This is for all s from 1 to k. What else? They are pairwise disjoint. So if I get a i intersection a j, i not equal to j and my i and j are running from 1 to k this is always equal to the empty set so meaning to say this family of sets this family of sets is pairwise disjoint right definitely they will be disjoint because the first entries will always be different what else can we say about this A sub i's? Take note that when you get the union of A sub 1, A sub 2, up to A sub k, what can you get? That will be the entire A times B, correct? So we have the union of A sub i, i from 1 to k is equal to A times b. So from number 3, we have that the cardinality of A times B is the same as the cardinality of the union of A sub I, I from 1 to K. However, this A sub I's are pairwise disjoint, correct? From this one, they are pairwise disjoint. So therefore, by theorem 4, how do we get the cardinality of the union of pairwise disjoint sets? It's just equal to the sum of the cardinalities of each set. So this is equal to the sum of the cardinalities of a sub i, i from 1 to k. But what is the cardinality of a sub i's? Cardinality of all the a sub i's is equal to L, right? So therefore, this is equal to sum of KL. So therefore, this is equal to KL and K is the cardinality of A and L is the cardinality of B. We have just proved the theorem. For our last slide, for any finite set A with cardinality of A equal to N, the cardinality of the power set of A is equal to 2 raised to the N. I will no longer prove this. I will just give this as a theorem. So what we have seen in this lesson is that whenever you construct new functions from finite sets, the result will again be finite. When you get the union of two finite sets, it will again be finite. When you get the product, it will still be finite. And when you get the power set of, finite, of a finite set, it will still be finite.